everybody. And I'm pretty sure that this is still Brennan Breed and I'm still Chris Holmes. And this is office hours, but this is not a Sunday morning. It is not live. It's pre-recorded, which is a bit of a shift for us, but we are uh, excited to experiment with this. Uh, as, for those of you that maybe don't know office hours or have forgotten it because you have COVID brain, uh, it was something birthed in the pandemic as a way to do high quality and uh, connected education using uh, the media that we had available during lockdown. And we had such a fun time during pandemic that we thought we would ex extend it beyond pandemic, although we're still in the pandemic. So that's yeah, a whole nother yeah. question. Um, <laughs> And, we, and for, for this series of uh, office hour sessions, we're talking about the book of Hebrews, which is uh, coincidentally or not coincidentally, the book, uh, the, one of the writings in the lectionary for this, the month of October and November. And so uh, we thought that was an easy segue in to a topic and to a book. And uh, you can expect that these will be about 25 to 35 minutes in length with the hope that uh, you will continue the conversation in your own context, whether on Sunday morning or in a midweek Bible study uh, or in any other context that you can imagine. So that's office hours. Brennan, what did I forget? Nothing, Chris. You remembered absolutely everything. Uh, yeah, so we're, yeah, we're going to be exploring Hebrews, and this should be a wonderful time. And thank goodness that there are a lot of really talented, wonderful scholars um, who have agreed to join us uh, and to help explain Hebrews to us. Um, and so I'm, I'm playing the role of the Old Testament guy who just, I, I'm along for the ride and learning what I can, and I'm so grateful uh, to be here. But uh, also, there's another person I'm really grateful to be here besides you, Chris, uh, right, and that is sure, Dr. Sure, Amy sure. Peeler, uh, um, who teaches at Wheaton and uh, has uh, published uh, several books, uh, uh, two on Hebrews, uh, uh, the, the book, in fact, that we are going to uh, be examining now, and uh, articles and lectionary helps and things like this, also serves as an associate rector uh, in a parish, uh, and so is uh, it, you know do, doing all sorts of things uh, good for the church uh, and for education in general, um, but also uh, then has some great things to say probably about, uh, I'm sure, about uh, preaching and teaching and using this in congregations and so on as well. So um, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Amy. We are so glad to have you here. Um, and let me, uh, let me just begin. We usually ask a couple of questions at first of our guests, um, and uh, uh, one of them uh, is that we generally ask people about some of their presuppositions that guide the way that they approach scripture, just that we none of us approach this in a vacuum, just like none of us approach this conversation in a vacuum. All of us have PTS or Princeton Seminary in our backgrounds. Um, and so we share kind of a, a language and a shared formation about how we approach texts. Uh, you know, it, all of us do it differently, I'm sure, but but all, but we're all formed in some way that's kind of similar. So I'm sure we share some of that, but I'm also sure that you bring some of your own uh, your own self to this in a way that, that, that Chris and I don't too. So, so uh, what are some of those kind of presuppositions that might uh, inform the way you read scripture? Yeah, well, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I love to speak about Hebrews and the opportunity to do so with old friends is quite a treat. The theological assumptions that are important to me is that I love the way in which uh, the biblical text is this bringing together of divine and human elements. I recognize that there could be some dangers in thinking about the scripture as incarnational. Um, I don't want to tread upon territory that I don't know because I'm not a systematic theologian. But I do see in that movement this amazing truth that God said, I'm going to involve humans in this project. And so I come to the text knowing that this is a word from God or trusting that this is a word from God. And I think I have good proof from that from Hebrews itself. Uh, right. The word is living and active. So the spirit is present here. But as a scholar, as someone who really has been afforded the great blessing of having the opportunity six days a week to think about this text, I also know that there's a human element here that is fascinating and beautiful. So I always think of the writing of the biblical text inspiration, not as if the Holy Spirit came upon these authors and they like go limp and their arm is moved along by the spirit, but their lives have been so shaped and orchestrated that when they come to write the text from their own personhood, from their own experience, those are precisely the words, the themes that God wants written. And so what behooves us as studiers of scripture is to learn all we can about this human an element. This is why we do things like word studies and think about historical background. What did it mean in their context as best as we can determine that? But then we don't have to be um, frustrated if we can't know all the answers, because we can also trust that God is at work in this text. And 
And so I would position myself as I want to, the text has my best in mind because God has my best in mind Mm -hmm. and God is big enough to take my questions. I can ask really hard questions of the text. There are texts that are difficult and challenging, but at the end of the day, I trust that God is both sovereign and good. And if this is God's word, then uh, maybe through a long study and maybe not even until the eschaton, I will see the ways in which this word is also sovereign and good. So that's a few of the approaches that that I bring, probably shaped by my time at PTS, but also now shaped for teaching for 12 years. Uh, that, that comes in as well. I love that. I love that. It reminds me that what you said about inspiration, I mean, it reminds me when I teach on inspiration in other contexts, I often tell people, you know, I want to have a, have a robust understanding of inspiration so that it's not just the creation of these texts, but it also covers like what a preacher does, you know, mm-hmm. studying a text and what what happens in the moment of preaching and what happens in the hearts and minds of listeners in that 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 homiletical moment, but also in the like years or, or weeks or days that follow where God is using something that Amy Peeler said in a sermon, a very human Amy Peeler, but through the inspiration of scripture, this word becomes anew, it becomes living, it becomes active. Um, and so not to equate human preaching with scripture, but to say that, 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 inspiration sort of covers both in important ways. Yes. And and that reminds me that God is big enough that there's multiplicity of meaning. Now there are barriers, right? It can't just mean anything you want it to, but while I want to understand historical context as best I can, I also am not limited to that because as I study the history of the church or even how the text has impacted lives of Christians today, Mm -hmm. oh my goodness, the spirit can lead to meetings and understandings. There's such a multivalence and a richness that I don't have to lock down just one thing. And that richness, I mean, this is why we read the Bible all the time. Sometimes my kids are like, well, we've already read that part (laughs) when we come to like family Bible reading. I'm like, well, yes, I've read that a few times too, but (laughs) Uh, uh, to say that, well, we change and God is at work such that maybe we hear things that we haven't noticed before. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So another question that we ask as a sort of entry point uh, for these conversations is about your own work. And it's an opportunity for you to share uh, anything that you're enthusiastic about, whether it's something that has been recently published or will be published or you know, maybe something you've drawn or I'm just joking about maybe, maybe could be that, but any of your work that you're, you want to, musical you talents. Highlight. <laughs> Brennan's got those, those things would be very few. Uh, <laughs> no, I, um, I honestly today, friends, right before I went to class and before this podcast, I sent off to my editor, the, the final product of a book that will come out in nice. the fall. Wow, and congrats. so, um, really, really excited. So my, I wrote my dissertation on the fatherhood of God in Hebrews, family metaphors in Hebrews. And at the same time, I was really energized by feminist literature, feminist theology that mm-hmm. raised excellent critiques against fatherhood language. So truly since my dissertation defense, I've said, I want to do a project on this. How do we understand fatherhood, not just in Hebrews, but more broadly in light of, um, you know, the questions about the valuing of women. And so that project has been forever. I don't know if you resonate with this at academics, but oh my goodness, things take much longer than you ever think that they uh, should. So when I started sabbatical in 2018, I had a blank computer screen said, I'm going to write this book and here we are still, and it's, it's just done, but this will come out with Erdman's in fall of 22 and it's entitled mother of God. My scholarship took an interesting trajectory that I didn't expect in that I turned my attention much more closely to the story of Mary. So this Mm -hmm. is really rooted in the birth narratives and it is posing that question. um, How can attending to her story help us understand the value of women in the Christian faith and then even more kind of provocatively, uh, how we understand God, that God is neither male nor masculine. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's, that is coming out. The other thing I'm working on is a commentary on Hebrews, uh, in the Christian formation commentary series. So, um, uh, I hope to finish that by the end of this school year, I've made some good projects. Uh, uh, progress. So that should come out uh, soon as well. That's a lot that you've done recently. (laughs) Well, like I say, I've been working on the mother of God book for like my entire life. It feels like so. um, (laughs) Yes. Glad that you you will finally give birth to that book uh, in the life of these metaphors. 
Yes, I write a lot about uh, ancient conception theories and birth. Yes, it's crazy. That's great. <laughs> yeah, well, wonderful. And uh, yeah, that is so great. Well, so thank you again for joining us to talk about Hebrews. And we're so glad that we have uh, like a global expert on Hebrews uh, to be right. able to, to guide us through this uh, this text. And, and not only because it's a biblical book and we want to be careful with it and, and learn about it, but also because Hebrews is kind of tricky, isn't it? It's a, it's a bit of a strange book, has a bit of a strange history, kind of different from some of these other books, right? Many people uh, are familiar with like some things that are in Hebrews, mm -hmm. but like the book itself, it's a bit like James in that way. The book itself, <laughs> self, lots of people haven't really read. Yeah. I even remember one of the first times sitting down to try to read Hebrews, um, like my, my senior year in high school or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm going to read this. And I remember sitting down and trying to read chapter one and thinking, what is going on? Uh, yeah. You know, I, and just not really being able to make it through the first chapter. So kind of flipping through and finding some other things in it and then calling that reading Hebrews. Um, but all to say, it is kind of, it is often kind of a confusing book uh, for folks. So since this is our first session, um, can you just help us understand what, what is Hebrews all about? You know, what are some of the maybe high points of it? Or maybe another way to say it is like, what is this author trying to tell us in a nutshell? Like, what's the point of the book? Yes. Oh, that's a wonderful question. And I do resonate with people's um, frustrations with the book. I think that you are exactly right. There are a few phrases that are well known. The word of God is living and active. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, right? These are, it's kind of bumper sticker verses that we mm. know, but it's really challenging to sit with the whole. And I think largely because one has to be really attuned to the scriptures and the cult the sacrificial system of Israel for this to make sense. And so I think sometimes if a preacher isn't tethered to the lectionary, there's a great tendency not to want to preach this because then you think, well, I've got to do all of Exodus and Leviticus before I can even get here. Why am I going to do that? Right. I'll go to the gospels. So I sometimes pull my students and I find a division. Some students really have never heard this text preached at all. And then some students who their pastors, for whatever reason, like loved the tabernacle, spent like four years in Hebrews but mm. it, it's kind of, there's very <laughs> few kind of in the middle that people get a sense of the story. I think there's one key thing, and, I, and maybe we'll get to this as we get to verses one through four, but it seems vital that this author is saying God is speaking. That really is the bedrock of the first sentence. And so I think if the author wanted us to know anything, his admonition for the readers would be, listen, he mm. very much believes that the texts of Israel are dynamic and through the Holy Spirit are communicating to his people today. So that would really be the first. And that maybe is the invitation that, okay, this book is hard. It's frustrating. I've had students say just the same thing. They enroll in my Hebrews class and they're like, I tried to read this. I couldn't get through. Okay, well, let's come around together. The other piece is the author is very emph emphatic on community. So maybe sometimes it's it's really hard to read on, the, on our own, but if we can have some people guide with us, we can. So then if it's broadly, listen, okay, well, listen to what? What is God saying? The other reason I love this book is that it's an excellent, excellent collection in maybe what we could say paradox or things that seem opposite. Uh, historically, again, you we both know, we don't know anything about this book, right? That's kind of fun. Like hmm. who's the background? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the author? Where? When? None of it. We don't know anything, uh, which gives a lot of freedom and imagination, I think. Um, but it is a beautiful picture of the Hellenization of the Jewish world. So I know in some literature, you've got, well, the Greco-Roman background, Jewish background. We know now that those things are intermingled. And Hebrew shows that in a beautiful way. It is recounting Israel's scripture to a higher degree than really any other book in the New Testament. And at the same time, it's very attentive to Greco-Roman and educational dynamics, uh, Greco-Roman kind of philosophical ideas of there's influence of maybe Neoplatonism that's developed, but I think it's present. So this person shows us the overlap of these worlds. That's kind of the historical thing in the background. But what I think is most profound theologically is that you have in Hebrews, primarily Hebrews 1 and 2, that's where it's set together, are the affirmations robustly of Christ's divinity and humanity. Mm -hmm. This book was vital.
vital for the early church. Early theologians, as they're conversing or thinking through debating the nature of Christ, Hebrews is a go-to text. I honestly think that's why Hebrews gets in the canon. Even without clear authorship, and really people are debating authorship in the ancient world, it was so vital to the regular fide, the construction of the faith about Christ's identity, that it was necessary to include. And so you have in Hebrews 1, these amazing affirmations of Christ's identity, the son's identity with the father, with right next to his flesh and blood and suffering and death in chapter two. So if you want Chalcedon, it's right here in Hebrews one and two, or the seeds are there, I think. Then that also points us to whom is the God that the son is revealing. And you have this interesting juxtaposition in Hebrews of the affirmations of God's holiness, that God is fearful, right? That God is uh, punishing the enemies. Hebrews is a scary book. Um, Brennan, my first encounter with Hebrews was also in high school as a sophomore. I came across chapter 10, where it says it is a fearful, uh, um, if we sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. I was like, oh my gosh, well, I have sinned willfully, right? I know yeah. I was. So I'm out. I'm done. Yeah. Um, and as like a very spiritually sensitive 15 year old, I really, really struggled with this text. Mm -hmm. And there are those fearful statements, but alongside them, there's amazing statements of affirmation, approach boldly, the throne of grace. Uh, he's perfecting ever those who are being sanctified. Christ is advocating for you, praying for you at the right hand of God, chapter seven. Mm -hmm. So how is it true that God's approachability and God's holiness are held together? So I think the message that the author wants us to hear in this book, listen, is that God is working in ways that are maybe unexpected. We probably need to get to the way in which this author deals with the first covenant. God is doing things that are consistent, but unexpected. And how do you trust God's faithfulness in the midst of these things that are held together that may seem to be opposite? I think that's ultimately the message of listening is you're in a place of precariousness. You've been persecuted executed, you're waning in your faith, but trust that God is faithful and that what he has revealed in Christ, what God has revealed of God's own character will carry you through until the end. So ultimately the message is God's faithfulness. If I had to put it into one mm -hmm. phrase. I love that. That was a whole like introduction to Hebrews in, you know, five minutes. Uh, so uh, people already have their money's worth uh, for this uh, free class. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> but so one of the things that we're, you know, trying to connect our study of Hebrews with the lectionary. And so the lectionary text for the first week, which is October 3rd, doesn't mean you have to watch this before or after October 3rd, but is, is a very often in the lectionary, we see these gaps in text. And yes. so it's Hebrews 1, 1 through 4, and then Hebrews 2, 5 through 12, all in one week. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we could start with the, the first four verses and then maybe hear a few words about like what's missing, why this gap, and then, and then talk about what we see in, in, uh, in chapter two, that would be helpful. So to begin with, you've already mentioned the reference to God's speech in the opening verses, but is there anything else in these first four verses that stands out to you as, as super significant or interesting? Yeah. So you do have the introduction of God's speech. And I love analyzing this verse with, with language students because one, one through four, as you all know, is one sentence, which displays the rhetorical finesse, the aptitude this author has with the Greek language. It's a beautiful sentence. I heard a lecture by John Webster, the now um, he's gone on to glory theologian who talked about one, one through four for upwards of two and a half hours at a conference. And it was like amazing. So there's so much here. Um, so the, the foundation of the sentence grammatically is God spoke. And then you get that comparison. God has always been speaking, but now is speaking in the sun. With the introduction of sun, then you have a series of clauses that hang on that in Rio that describe the sun. And they're all in, um, I, I think one that grabs the attention, the only finite verb there is he sat down. So I think even grammatically, the author is drawing our attention to these, God spoke, the sun sat down. And you might say, a, a modern reader might say, well, that's kind of boring. Why, why would sitting down matter? <laughs> but I think that's a way of referring to the session, right? The finished work of Christ. So right here at the beginning, listen, 
to what God has done in the son and know that the son's work is already done. That really underlines what I was saying about faithfulness. If they're in a period of worry or doubt, they really are directed. Their eyes are directed. Christ's work is already settled, right? All you have to do is to press into what he's already done. The other thing I would say about one, one through four, and here's where historical background is really illuminating. A lot of the phrases that the author says about Christ, which are these kind of very high Christological statements, that he's the reflection of God's glory, the imprint of God's character, he's with God at creation, through whom God created the world. Um, if you were a reader in the first century, you would know those phrases because they're the same kinds of things that are said about God's wisdom, the wisdom tradition, or God's logos, the word. And so you can read in Proverbs or Wisdom Solomon or Philo of Alexandria. Alexandria, the ways in which these authors would speak of how does God interact with the world? Well, God has kind of like this divine emanations of God directs things through wisdom or directs things through God's word. So you have phrases that can be mapped on explicitly to Jewish authors in the first century. But what's fascinating to me about Hebrews is that he bookends those by the affirmation of sonship. Right. So I think he is shaping, hey, yes, we already believe that God can interact with the world through wisdom and word. But I want to tell you that that wisdom and word is a person uh, who is in relationship with God. And I think it seems right that you get an affirmation here of an eternal personal relationship. I'm not saying there's full-blown Trinity here. In fact, many people have asked, hey, where's the Holy Spirit in, in this chapter? Um, but there is a way in which this kind of divine thing, wisdom or word, is then personified in sonship. Uh, it, it, to me, strikingly seems a really similar to what John does in chapter one uh, of the Gospel of John. Hey, you know about Logos? Logos is divine. Logos organized the world. Yeah, everybody agrees that's what Logos is. Guess what Logos took on flesh, 114. Yeah, it's that yeah. same kind of pivot um, that I see this author doing as well. Which, and then ultimately, you get at the beginning here an affirmation affirmation of the son's relationship with the father. Uh, and it seems to be that's the audience already agrees on this. They've already confessed Christ. They're not kind of wondering, is he God or not? Nope. They're already there. And so the author starts with something they're already agreeing on. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. We, uh, clearly supporting what you said earlier about why this was important in Christological debates uh, yes. in the second, third and fourth centuries, uh, for sure. Yes. Uh, so then so then what happens in uh, one five through uh -huh. two four that, I mean, is there anything important there or uh, can we just skip to two five? A great question. And I so appreciate the makers of the lectionary, right? In so many weeks, I just see the artistry of how they bring texts together. Um, and so I don't want to talk down to them because I really appreciate what they've done. But I do sometimes wonder why, why have we cut out things, right? Couldn't we just have an extra three minutes and include that, you know? Um, so what's going on here? It's so uh, vile. My sense is that the lectionary is giving our attention to what I said a moment ago, the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, his relationship with God, his relationship with humanity. We get that in the lectionary. And so in some ways, what comes in between is a further highlighting of those truths. But when, off, when readers are able to attend to the rest of chapter one, they notice a series of Old Testament citations, right? So this is a really great place for those who want to think about the relationship between Israel's scriptures and the New Testament. You get a katina of these. And what you recognize, uh, there's many things, but I'd like to highlight um, the foci of two, is that many of these texts are royal texts. These are things that are said to the heir of David. That's right at the beginning in 1.5, you are my son, today I've begotten you, and again, I will be to him as a father, and he will be to me as a son. From Psalm 2.7, a royal psalm, 2 Samuel 7.14, uh, the promise to David's heir. So the author in some of the citations is saying, hey, you know, there has been among some Jewish people a hope for a Messiah. And of course, that's a very complex hope in the first century world. But these texts resonated with some. We're looking for an heir of David. The author is saying Jesus is that heir, right? And this is, again, what most of the writers of the New Testament affirm. So he's talking about common agreement. What I find a little bit more interesting is when he takes 
other text, the citation in 1.6 is a good example. Let all the angels of God worship him. This is from Moses' song in Deuteronomy 40, uh, 32. There, if you go to original context, that is Moses calling forth, hey, let all the angels worship God, Yahweh, who has just delivered us. The author of Hebrews has pivoted that or used that verse in a different context to say, now I'm going, this, this statement is about the son. And in fact, who's saying it? The father, the father is speaking the son. So what Moses was saying about God, now God, the father is saying about God, the son. So that's a whole nother realm of attribution to the son. Is he the Messiah? Absolutely. Is he now worthy of worship as God is worthy of worship? Yes. And so I'm, I'm influenced here by Richard Bauckham's reading of this. Uh, I think he has a really good treatment that Jesus, the son is then afforded um, what is afforded to God, that God is worthy of worship, that God is eternal, that God is creator. That's the rest of the Katina. So it is that melding together of different hopes, messianic hopes, as well as hopes for what God will do for God's people are unified in the son. Uh, so I think that's one wonderful study. And that's definitely something if someone wants to go deeper, very easy to do. Look at all the citations, go and read what is going on in that portion of Israel scriptures, and then see how the author of Hebrews is, um, again, not, not, uh, I think, putting a new spin, like something that is egregious, right? He's not misreading them, but he's bringing out an element that maybe hadn't been seen before in those texts. Yeah. And yeah. I think for me, like when I was in high school trying to read uh, Hebrews for the first time, and I kind of ran aground. I mean, the first four verses are great. And then you kind of run aground in this, in this, as you're saying, Katina, like a, a chain of, of, of quotations, mm -hmm. because I wasn't familiar with them. I had no idea where they came mm -hmm. from. I had not read the Old Testament right? very much because most yeah. Christians just don't. Exactly. Um, so all to say that, like, I mean, the more familiar you are with the source material that you're, the, the, you know, th this is again the part of the human element that you mentioned um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the beginning uh, when you, when you were explaining your your presuppositions about scripture, right? I mean, it, this is part of that human element that that uh, this the book of Hebrews doesn't come out of a vacuum; it's coming out of this deep and rich cultural matrix, which seems to be very thoroughly saturated with knowledge of the Old Testament, uh, which might be why people called it Hebrews, right? It seems to be written to mm -hmm. people who are so familiar with, with even wh wherever they come from biologically, they're really, really deeply saturated with this kind of culture. And part of that is also sacrifice, right? The sacrificial mm -hmm. system, which was taken to be really important, um, of, of great importance, and and not just uh, symbolically, but but really in, uh, of great deep importance. So yeah, Nathan, I, I love that idea, but also the, the kingship, right? This idea of kingship, which wasn't just metaphorical. I mean, there's this real notion of uh, that we're, we're waiting, you know, we're waiting for an actual king to arrive or something, right? And so what is this? Uh, so anyway, I, I love that. Uh, the, the, the things that look boring to us, or really confusing to us made sense to ancient people. And all we need is just a little help from people like Amy right. Peeler to help us uh, right. you know, see these things that we're missing that actually make it interesting and make sense. So I, I do love that. Um, but it's also really interesting that this author feels, uh, it, you know, this kind of slightly creative use of these texts. And it would have seemed creative of people who knew yeah. the Song of Moses, which was super popular all throughout the history of Judaism and still is today. Um, people would have been familiar with this uh, at, the, at the Exodus event, um, would also have been familiar with this kind of interesting reuse of it. Um, so to say that this is a, a slightly different um, way of using scripture than some of us might be used to in certain kinds of churches, uh, let's say in the United States today. Um, but that's, but that, that was part of that cultural matrix that we're kind of missing in a way. Does that make sense? Is that, is that true? Or is that? Yeah, that... no. And I just want to underline what you're saying there, because this distinguishes this author from Paul. And I realize sometimes those background debates are who wrote it. That's when I say I work on Hebrews, this is the first question. If I had a dime yeah, yeah. every time I've gotten that question, it would be amazing. Um, but, you know, Paul, when he introduces the scriptures of Israel, he will say, it has been written. And going back to emphasize the importance of listening, this author always introduces scripture as God's speech. Uh, to whom has he said? And so it's not as if he is just saying, hey, I've got some proof texts uh, to support that Jesus is God. He actually attends to places where God is speaking in the text. He said, God is speaking this. Yes, he spoke uh, these texts. He inspired these texts, but God is speaking this to the son. And so the authority that he grants by putting this on the lips of God 
is quite powerful. Mm. Uh, it, who, who could disagree with that, right? So it definitely is a creative use, um, but he is kind of allowing us, Harold Altred said, he allows us to listen into a divine conversation. And then in yeah. chapter two, yeah. you get Jesus's response. Jesus then speaks to the father with scripture as well. Yeah. Well, and I, I love, I love that, that language or, or what you did to, to point out that this is God's speech. I've, I've heard uh, the idea that this is like a, a dramatization of the enthronement of the son, yes. that, that what we overhear and oversee, you mentioned earlier in, in the first four verses, the idea of, of Jesus's sitting uh, at the right hand of God, the father yes. here, we sort of hear God's language of you know, install installation sermon almost of, of the sun. And again, there's an element where rhetorically we're invited to enter into this and not, not necessarily to say, oh, is this from this Psalm or from that Psalm, but to hear it the way that the author has constructed it to really hear it as this like heavenly enthronement speech that I think in some ways moves us as hearers or listeners or readers into that presence that we are you know, we're, we're, we're invited to see ourselves as participating in this uh, eternal declaration of the son's worth and uh, installation at the right hand of God. Absolutely. Chris, that is so good. Yes. Um, this isn't absent from us, but we get to stand around. We get to join in with, yeah. as the people of Israel joined in, as the angels are praising, we get to join in to that. And then the last spoken word in Hebrews is that people get to speak in chapter 13. Uh, the, vo the words of scripture are put on the lips of the audience for the first time. So they get it, even an answer in the drama. Oh, that's cool. Oh, that's yeah. great. I love that. Yeah, this neat, that's so, a neat way to just to thinking about scripture. Like this is like a new Psalm that's being written using old Psalms that says right. something new and a little bit different than, you know, yeah. but, but starting with this ancient coronation Psalm, Psalm two, um, and yeah, re, re, readjusting it, which, uh, you know, it, it, that's just, that's really neat. And of course, Psalm two uh, is also used in the gospels um, for the, uh, the, the baptism of Christ. And this is part of the message that comes out of the heavens from God about this. And so seeing this here and also seeing this in the, in the, in the gospels is really interesting as well. Um, you know, whether or not this author knew of the gospels that were being written fairly simultaneously, some of them write to this. Yeah. yeah. He does seem to have an aptitude for tapping into texts that are widely used by other authors. Psalm 110 is the best example, Psalm 22 yeah. as well. But then he will often draw other implications from them or draw from the wider parts of those chapters. I sometimes say to my yeah. student, he's the student who reads past the assignment. <laughs> so if the assignment was 22, one, Psalm 22, one, well, he reads to later parts and, and see, or if the yeah. assignment was Psalm 110, one, well, he reads to 110, three and discovers this interesting figure, Melchizedek. So I, yeah. it seems to me that he is aware, or at least it's, it's uncanny if he's able to highlight all these texts that are quite so popular in the Christian movement, if he didn't already kind of know that people were talking about them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So this oh, is that's, a skilled that's ancient uh, scholar. This is, I mean, as, as you've mentioned, you talked about rhetoric, right? I mean, this person yes. is trained yes. in particular tools of communication and reading and so on. and would have seemed very intelligent, right? To the, and would have seemed very learned to the peoples around. Um, so anyway, that's just an, uh, one of the ways this, this emanates out of this person. That's really, really cool. Thank you. Yeah. So can we, so there's, we're going to, we're going to wrap up this, this part of our conversation in a few minutes, but I think there's two, there's two topics that are worth our consideration and they're somewhat related. Sure. Uh, the first is, as you mentioned your dissertation, the, the fatherhood of God mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the role of family language. And so if you could just talk a little bit about that, but then also what we see uh, in Hebrews 2, 5 through 12 about the son, and in particular, about the role of suffering yeah. and this idea that Jesus is perfected, which mm -hmm. probably causes some Christians a little bit of indige indigestion. So mm -hmm. um, uh, if you could talk about maybe a little bit of those two things as briefly as you can, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up this part of our conversation. Sure. Yeah, the author of Hebrews says this three times throughout the letter that Jesus became perfect, which is really striking, not just in light of kind of what we know about Christian tradition more broadly, but he's already kind of done a whole lot of work in chapter two to say that the son is God, right? <laughs> right? The right. Son of 
So how can God then become perfect? I think 2.10, where that language is used for the first time, is really illuminating. And of course, your, your listeners might know that perfection, and the word here in, is telos, is quite expansive. Mm-hmm. So it's not only employed when someone is lacking something or has made an error and then they fix that error. That would be an inappropriate application to the son because it is the author of Hebrews who actually says, being tempted in all ways and yet without sin. So, okay, proof text, right? He pretty much says Jesus never messes up. Okay, so we got to go with that because that's within this letter. But perfection or telos can also be completion or maturity. And um, there's a great monograph on this. David Peterson has done some really nice work thinking about telos in the ancient world and how it's used in Hebrews. So I'm skipping forward to his conclusions. But what I find convincing is that in chapter uh, 10, the author uses Psalm 40, puts it on the lips of Jesus and says, I have come to do your will. When he's entering and I've come to do your will. So Jesus's intention in becoming human, taking on flesh and blood. Well, that intention is all well and good, but that intention had to come to fruition. He had to go ahead and offer himself to be willing to suffer the shame of the cross, uh, to be then resurrection, resurrected. So perfection, especially perfection in suffering, the way we can think about it is a completion of the task, the divine will to reconcile all things had to actually come to fruition. It couldn't just be an intent. And so then that also points to the way in which Jesus becomes perfect as the priest. And, And we haven't talked about that too much yet. I know we're getting there, but a priest then has to make the sacrifice. And so He does that. And I would also argue that he becomes perfect as the heir. This is actually the first thing that's said about the son. So God has spoken to us in the son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Well, if Jesus is reigning over all, if he will inherit all things, we learn in chapter two that there's a problem with that because the human part of the inheritance is under the control of the fear of death even the devil. So it's this is a bit of a kind of a uh, way in a supernatural way of thinking about the enemy of God. The humans are under this fear of death. Well, if Christ is going to be perfect as the heir to really reign over all, he has to win back that part of his human inheritance. Well, he does that by suffering death. And so perfection is not that he's in error or lax, but he has to complete the plan that the divine will has decided on for the recompense of, of all things, including humans. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think yeah, we helpful. could also be open to, especially in chapter five, you get the sense of the struggle that he has, the great cries and tears that he gives to God as he prays to come through death. Uh, there is an allowance that if he's truly human, which Hebrews asserts robustly, that he's going to have a growth and a development. And in that way, Hebrews lines up so beautifully with the gospels, in particular right. Luke, who gives us a bit of, an, of a reflection on what it is for Jesus to be a young man, a boy and how he's growing in wisdom and stature and favor with God of man, Luke 2.52. I see those lined up quite well with one another. So to conclude, perfection then is fulfillment. Protection, perfection is vocational, that he truly steps into what God has called him to be as priest and heir. And perfection is in his human life, a period of growing into maturity, into an so understanding this, of his call. So this connects also with the beginning of our of our second lectionary text, uh, two verses five through eight, that uses Psalm eight. Uh, and thinking of Psalm eight saying that, uh, you know, it, in its initial ancient context probably means something like, you know, aren't um, humans kind of amazing? I mean, why, why is it that we have these problems, but also we we have dominion in some way over, you know, we have sovereignty over the earth in some way, right? I mean, how did humans end up like this? You know, that we, we can do these things and other animals can't and so on. You know, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a reflection on that, right? But uh, then uh, the, the author of Hebrews says, yeah, well, Jesus was made a little, little lower than angels for a while, but then, so this said uh, that, that perfection, you know, kind of growing into the stature of, you know, this, it, this, he was humbled in a way um, to be uh, made human and baby and so on and having to grow and having to learn and having to go through this suffering, but then also eventually coming out the superior. And it just, it's, it's like one of these things where um, at, at first, when I read, read this, I remember thinking like, who would ever argue that Jesus is lower than angels or something, but mm-hmm. in that context, right. Yes. In let's say the year 65 yes. ADCE, right? Somewhere around there, you know, like 
it was not for sure that Jesus was higher than angels uh, or that Jesus was fully divine or that Jesus was even fully human. Right? No, this was all in the flux, right? People, you know, this was, this was all being argued about and no, no one was, was completely certain about this. Uh, uh, so, yeah. so having this person say, okay, so it's kind of a concession here is to be like, well, then why was Jesus a baby if Jesus was perfect and if Jesus was whatever. And, and so like, this is, this is one of those arguments that's trying to help people understand um, who Jesus is right. And in the midst of like a marketplace of ideas in which there's lots of different conceptions of who Jesus is, right? Is that, is that yeah. I mean, and so it seems like there's arguing against some people who might have been saying Jesus actually is lo- like an angel or less than an angel. Like, Absolutely. I mean, Arianism yeah. might be like what I, I jumped to, but I know that's centuries from this, but, yeah. but this idea that Jesus was made or created or is mm-hmm. a human or something like that, right? Yes, yes. And I'm so glad you brought up the angel connection, which is another question that comes about chapter one, right? I don't think a whole lot about angels on a regular basis, but this <laughs> author seems to have a whole lot to say about angels. Well, why does he care? I think you've tapped into exactly this kind of ancient conception of a chain of being, of ontology, right? It's God, angels, humans, animals, etc. from down there. So he's made this argument in chapter one, Jesus is above the angels. Well, the, if you go above the angels, the only place you can go is the God side of the line. But then he comes in chapter two and explicitly cites Psalm eight to say, and he was made below the angels for a while. What he does is he takes Psalm eight, which as you stated, is a psalm of praise. Aren't humans great? And he transforms it into a story. Jesus was made lower for a while, but through the suffering of death has become crowned with glory and honor. He turns it into that kind of parabolic treatment, like a down and an up. That's how I think about Philippians 2 as well. Um, What has always been true of humanity, Jesus entered in for a time. So yes, is Jesus on the God side of the line? But, But how did he get there? And Chris, this goes back to your statement of enthronement. He got there by going through the path of suffering, by going through the path of humility. Um, And so he's able to say, maybe communities are doubting either way. Like, is Jesus really up there with God? Or was Jesus really human? Like, do we have some incipient docetism? I think we have that in the Johannine community. So was he really a human? He's saying, no, it's really both. And the story then he, he laces through Psalm 8. And it, and, and in, in uh, just in two nine, uh, the, 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 I think we see the paradox of the Christian faith, which says Mm -hmm. that, that Jesus was crowned with glory and honor. Great, great. We all can get behind that. But then the next phrase, because of the suffering of death. And that's that paradox that nobody in the ancient world, I think, would have said, like, this is the means by which someone gets glory and honor. The way that you get glory and honor in the ancient world, as I understand it, is you go and destroy all your enemies. Like you you are victorious in battle. You are strategic in political alignments. You don't die on a cross. And that this yeah. is the message of, of Hebrews 2 is that th- this, this perfection, if we can go back to it, this, this uh, completion of the vocation for Jesus was not through military might or victory, but it was through being a normal human and yeah. suffering, you know, in, in undignified death. That that, I, again, for me, what I have always loved about Hebrews is how that then connects with the struggle that we see the community facing later mm-hmm. in, in chapters 10 through 12 mm-hmm. uh, that we'll get to uh, at a later time. But I just, again, so much richness about who Jesus yeah. is how Jesus connects with humanity uh, and how Jesus connects with God. Something that just struck me about that. Like, I mean, just thinking, you know, what if someone had walked around and said, Hey, in the ancient world, Hey, Julius Caesar's greatest glory and honor was that he got stabbed to death by his buddies. That was, that was the real pinnacle. That's how you know that Julius Caesar was a true emperor was that he was stabbed to death by his buddies. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, the, no, his glory and honor was that he destroyed the Gauls that he, you know, like was vanquished his enemies. He became, sort of emperor right i mean like just it, just just to, to put that in, in in or you know alexander the great's greatest victory was that he got poisoned to death in babylon right um no you know uh they, no one would have ever said that but the, but for the christians to walk around saying this and for learned people like this to walk around saying these things they knew sounded foolish uh is is really is really something <laughs> yeah that's uh yeah. uh but uh, hard for us to imagine or grasp i think today too yeah and it, and, and and that and that he will then lead many children to glory which yes. suggests that this connection with discipleship, that the way for humans to glory for followers of Christ is, 
going to be, you know, to use Michael Gorman's language, cruciform. We, we will be shaped by this hmm. story of the cross. Um, maybe not that we all also will suffer these sorts of deaths, but, but that we will, we will live in a way that is modeled off of that view of glory and honor instead of the one that the world offers. And then if I might add, just as an yeah, addendum yeah. to that, you asked me about fatherhood. Well, I think yeah. a really interesting question that comes here is it is the father who leads the son through suffering. It's the father who allows this. And this becomes a profound reflection in chapter 12. They're in the yeah. midst of suffering. And the author says to them, that's not a sign of God's absence. That's a sign of God's care and discipline for you. And I think he's prepared the way for that discussion by saying, look at the intimacy of relationship that the father has with the eternal son. Even there, the father allowed the son to go through suffering, allowed the son to be disciplined, to come to the place of glory. So you shouldn't, friends, be quite surprised that you too are going through suffering and, and on your path to glory. So he aligns their experience of God's fatherhood with that of the son. Now, again, feminist scholarship is very good to draw our attention to what does that say about the character of God, that God would allow suffering? And those are hard questions to ask. But I think the picture of God's fatherhood that we get here is truly of a good parent. And we all have children. We know this. A good parent does allow some struggles for that growth and maturity. If we do everything for our children, if we don't allow them to go through the hard, uh, then they're not going to come to the place of maturity. And even more profound, when we have a sense of the intimacy between the father and the son, the son's divinity, God really has not asked God's people to do anything that God hasn't already done. God himself has taken the depth of the suffering and so then um, doesn't honor suffering for suffering's sakes, but will allow difficult situation for that refinement and that taking on of God's characteristics. It says at the end of that process, you will have peace and holiness, all these things that then will benefit you um, on that journey of faith. Mm. Yeah, and the, the, the mention of the um, brothers and sisters, the siblings in uh, verse 12 mm -hmm. of chapter two, that yes. taken from, from, the, from the, the end of Psalm 22, which was used yes. uh, on, on the cross exactly. uh, in the gospels, right. but somebody read to the end, right? Like you said, um, yes. somebody read all the way to the end of Psalm 22 to the part where there's a proclamation of praise. Uh, and so this is put on, on Jesus's mm -hmm. lips, um, but also, yeah, this idea that like, uh, this is the fan, Jesus is part of the family, like you know, our sibling, um, which is also amazing, right? Uh, right. And that this, um, Jesus has done all this for us. I mean, one thing I do uh, want to just put on the table, we don't have to solve this or answer this, we'll get to this again, but just, the, you know, there's this shift toward, to, the, to the language of high priest at the end of chapter two and atonement, um, which suggests that people were very familiar with these concepts, but also it puts Jesus in the position of kind of prophet in a way, uh, but also of king, uh, the one who is in, installed and enthroned, you know, next to the throne of God and so on, but now also the, the high priest. Um, and I don't know if you have any final thoughts about kind of high priest atonement, uh, what would that have meant to someone in the ancient world? Why would this have been important? And what would this have meant in this context, uh, not just kind of in the in the, the, the temple in Jerusalem or something? Right. Uh, the great thing about the, the Greco-Roman world at this time is that everybody has sacrificed and priest. And sometimes I think that's something that maybe uh, contemporary readers today don't realize. We know, oh, Israel had this whole thing going on, mm -hmm. but the prevalence of animal sacrifice, of having a mediator between yourself and the gods, this is widespread in religious context everywhere. This is not just a Jewish thing. So really readers of any background could see this as, oh yes, high priest is the one who represents me, right? That one who stands with a face toward God and then face toward me. And that really then becomes the point of connection between, well, why is he talking so much about Jesus as God and Jesus as human, divine and human? Well, it's because then he's moving toward priesthood. And that really is. So if I made the argument that the audience already agrees on the kind of things he confesses about Jesus at the beginning. Mm -hmm. He sets that agreement up so that he can get to seemingly a more difficult topic. What does it mean for Jesus to be priest? And of all the New Testament, he's the only one to use this language explicitly. This is not a common idea yet. Now, some have made the argument that there are allusions to Jesus's priesthood in the Gospels. I'm very open to entertaining that idea. I think that could be possible. He's the only one that says it explicitly. Yeah. And so, and even in Israel, the joining together of priest and king, these roles are usually separated, right? right? You have David and Zadok, you have Aaron and Moses. For him to say, no, nope, no, nope, this is brought together in one person, he's got 
got to do a whole lot of work to do that. But that kind of innate concept, I need someone to stand between me and God because I know that God is holy and other, that would resonate across cultures. Hmm. I love that. Yeah, thanks. Oh my gosh. Well, we could clearly, we could clearly keep going uh, for hours and hours. Um, uh, but we did say we would, we would limit ourselves to these sessions to make them a little bit more bite sized for our groups uh, and for congregations. So we're going to wrap up here, but uh, we will have another conversation uh, with the brilliant uh, Amy Peeler uh, on Hebrews 4 12 through 16 and the material that comes obviously before it and uh, setting up that conversation. But uh, Amy, we want to say thank you so much for this illuminating conversation. It feels like an entire semester of New Testament in 25 or 30 minutes. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. And we can't wait to continue the conversation. Well, your, your students are, are uh, fortunate people to have you uh, teaching them. And, uh, and so does, so does your, your, your parish as well as, you know, uh, fortunate to have you as well. Uh, and, and we are also fortunate to have your time. So thank you so much for coming. And enjoy. joy. <laughs>